to talk about a couple different things today. I'm Joe Balog. I'll give you a, uh, an intro to me here in a second as to who I am. Uh, but, but I want to start by getting kind of a little show of hands. How many people are here for a seminar, a fishing seminar? <laughs> <laughs> See there? So far, I'm batting a thousand. Uh, and you heard that it was going to be a little bit of fall bass fishing and a little bit of plastics for panfish probably, right? Yeah. Did you guys hear that? Um, how many people are mainly here for the bass stuff? And how many people are mainly here for the panfish stuff? And how many, and how many people are mainly here for both? Free beer. Free beer? First one. Crack it open. Yeah, that's, uh, we're going to give some stuff away tonight, by the way. Do you have a Mercury engine? Do you have a boat with a Mercury? So you would have just won this. Okay. I do. Uh, who does? <laughs> you do? You have a boat with a Mercury? Yeah. This is Quick Clean. This is an engine, uh, a fuel product that Mercury makes. They require, not require, they recommend that you use it quite a bit. I use it like every single tank because right. ethanol is bad, bad, bad yeah, for, for, uh, for outboards. Um, and this is like a little safety safety valve for that. So uh, so it really, really helps. But this little thing here treats 72 gallons. Oh, so okay. a small tank, you know, this will go a long, long way. So I need it. How many other people have a Mercury now? Yes, you know, everything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, your hat back there has got one. The guy with the canoe on his My Volvo just turned into a Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a little something there. Uh, but we're going to talk about some bass stuff. We're going to talk about some pants. Does anybody have some major time requirement where they have to leave in a half an hour and they're here just to hear one or the other? Like, oh, I'm just there. I hope he does pan fish first because I got to leave. No? Okay, so we're, we're pretty good. I won't spend a whole lot of time. I, I really got the, um, got the feeling that more people were probably going to be here for pan fish and perch and plastics and artificial stuff than bass. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about bass because that's primarily what, what I, I have some notoriety for and what I do, but I pan fish fish and, and, and perch fish and fish for every species of fish in this lake, except for sturgeon. I haven't sturgeon fished, but I fish for, for everything in that lake, you know, almost daily. So, so I feel like I've got a pretty good wealth of knowledge on it. And um, that plastics pan fish stuff that has been getting more and more popular, thanks in part probably to this store, you know, it was, it was definitely, um, uh, brought to a lot of anglers' attention, you know, how many fish we can catch, good eater fish, bluegills, crappies, perch, rock bass, uh, in the cold weather months especially without using live bait. And if you haven't done a whole lot of that, it's awesome. And I'm going to talk all about that uh, and give you some, some little uh, stories and facts and figures that will probably blow your mind as far as how productive that can be. Uh, but a little intro to my to, about me. My name's Joe Balog. I fish a lot of the big bass tournament trails all across the country. FLW, the Bass Opens, um, and and have won some big tournaments fishing. Uh, but most of my notoriety and, and most of what I do is is work with the outdoor press and a lot of promotions and marketing work here in the Great Lakes sector. Uh, I work a lot within fishermen on their magazine, their TV, internet. Uh, I'm on the advisory committee for North American fishermen. I, I do a lot of work with Bassmaster, Bass Times. Um, outdoor life, you name it. I'm also the waterfowl guy for Realtree, so I do a lot of duck hunting here. Okay, and I also uh, have have uh, gained a lot of credibility, a lot of press the last few years doing ice fishing work with Clam Outdoors and Plano and a bunch of other guys. And I ice fish here. This is where I live, right up the street, and and this is where I spend the majority of my time. The big bass tournaments take us sometimes far away. Um, I grew up on Lake Erie. My dad was a charter boat captain on Lake Erie. I moved up here about uh, eight or ten years ago and have since really fallen in love with St. Clair. Um, Erie and St. Clair are two different animals, but man, it's just St. Clair is so awesome because there's so many opportunities and there are so many fish in that lake. It's unbelievable. To the average person that doesn't fish a lot or to somebody that fishes other bodies of water, when they came up, when they came, come up here to fish, it blows them away with just the general number of fish in that lake. Um, they're not all big. As everybody who's ever ice fish know, uh, there's tons of little perch in that lake. You know, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what you can do to catch some bigger fish. But, but Lake St. Clair is a very, very productive lake. And by that, you know, biologically speaking, when they say something's productive, it's got a lot of fish per acre. If you, if you sat back and you said, today I'm going to create the perfect lake for fishing in Michigan, you would have a lake that had primarily shallow water, 
primarily less than 20 feet deep. You want light penetration all the way to the bottom so it could have plant life in all different depth zones. You want current, you probably want some kind of channel running down the middle with some pretty deep water. You want some shallow bays for spawning. And you would have just created Lake St. Clair. Okay, that's what it is. You know, 95% of that lake is less than 20 feet deep, and it's 99% of it's got weed drift. So it's a very, very uh, productive lake. There's a lot of fish per acre. So, so we're very fortunate, and, and, and uh, you know, there, there's a lot of different fish species. It's, it's probably, and this is coming from a guy who's fished everywhere, the best smallmouth bass lake in the world. Okay, and by that I mean you'll catch more two and a half to four pound smallmouth bass there than anywhere else right now in the world. Now a lot of lakes cycle, and a lot of lakes are good at different times, and there's places you can catch eight pound smallmouth that you probably won't catch here. But for quality fish and numbers of them, it's it's top tops. It's also a real good perch lake. It's a real good bluegill lake. It's a fairly decent crappie lake. It's a decent walleye lake. But it's, it's pretty good in a whole lot of categories. Um, so so we'll we'll talk about what you can do to catch more fish out there. If anybody's got any questions as I'm going, like hey, what pound line is that, or what what'd you call that lure, or whatever. There's, I've got too much to say, and I'm not going to keep you here for two hours. So I'm going to go fairly quick, and if you just have a question, either just raise your hand or yell it out right then and there. We'll also save some questions if you want for the end, and I'll have a little question and answer session. Um, I'll be here afterwards to show you some of the gear that I talked about that's all up here on display. But, but if you've got any questions or anything, this is real informal. I know there's guys that have never fished, you know, that fish once or twice a year in this audience, and there's guys that fish a hundred days a year on this lake in this audience. So I mean, you know, there's all different skill levels, there's all different experience levels, but we'll we'll just take it from the top. You got your notepad and everything, man. You should be the Front row, answered the first question, and he's writing down notes. This thing is something that's gonna do All right, uh, and we're gonna give stuff away. Who knows what this is? Oh, Alabama. Alabama. I was hoping somebody would raise their hand or there'd be an obvious winner. I can't all say it in unison. This is no clue. Uh, who says, how many people here say the, the name of this thing is an Alabama rig? Raise your hand. Who says it's something else? Umbrella rig. That guy. This is an umbrella rig. Okay? Just like um, this isn't a. Mr. Twister, this is a grub or a twist tail grub. Alabama rig is one of the names of one of these that the man's bait company has the patent for and has the rights to the name of it. So you win the first giveaway. Have you ever used one of these no, I have umbrella not. rigs? No, okay. I have not. Well, if you do, you're going to find out two things. The first thing you're going to find out is that they don't work everywhere all the time and they're not the magic bait. Right? Sometimes they work good. The second thing is when you're done using it because you haven't caught anything, you're going to go like this, you clip it on your rod, you're going to cut it off and set it in your boat, and you're going to go, something is going to tangle. <laughs> or like me, my dog, and the boat are all going to be hooked at the same time. <laughs> okay, this is a Plano umbrella rig tackle box. And what they've done is they have these little dividers in these now that have, and I don't have one set up, but that little thing, essentially what happens is this bends down and it goes in there, all four arms, five arms go in there at one time. Okay, one, two, no, it's hard to do when it's not in the box. And then it opens back up and it holds those arms, okay, in the box and they can't move. It holds them collapsed like that. So, so in order to properly store your umbrella ring, you need the Alabama rig box. <laughs> okay. So, uh, pass this back nobody's, to that guy. He's the first winner of the Alabama rig box. And we'll, we've got two more of those. We'll give them away. Somehow I'll think of a trivia question. Also, we'll give away today a Plano hat. We'll give away a Plano, a really cool Plano t-shirt. Only worn twice. <laughs> and we're going to give away this guy, one of these, this is the Gobi replica. Has anybody tried this? This is the, one of the new big bass baits. We only got, we got a couple people that have tried it. Um, it this works. is a new Gobi lure, and I'm going to talk about that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about bass stuff real quick, 
and then we'll get right into the panther stuff. Um, the goby lure that I just held up, this is it. This is the goby lure. I'll give you a little history of this. Is anybody willing to let me lob this into the mouth? I do that every <laughs> summer. I probably will get somebody that'll do it. No. Right here. You think you can make it this far? Yeah, come on. Yeah. I got an overhand cast it though. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Weighs an ounce. Uh, an ounce. This is an ounce a new friends. swim bait. Okay? And swim bait is like a lure category in bass fishing that typically means something really big that looks like a fish. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you cast it out and swim it. But this is a very big, heavy, bottom dragging bait that lays upright on the bottom just like a goby. Uh, it's designed to be fished on a real big heavy rod like this seven and a half or eight foot heavy casting rod with heavy line. It's a trophy, trophy smallmouth bait. Um, and I designed it, okay, and, and, and we market it and uh, it's, it's something that I came up with. Has anybody ever used a goby lure of any kind? A drop shot goby, a little plastic thing that looks like a goby, something that on the package says goby, yep. about a tube that's the color goby. <laughs> okay, the, there was no goby baits until I created the first one. And I know that sounds pompous and that sounds crazy, but like 15 years ago, um, we were catching bass on Lake Erie. There was gobies in Lake Erie really before there were in Lake St. Clair. It started in the Detroit River, we'll go quick. So the western basin of Lake Erie, um, I fished all the major bass tournaments there in the 80s and 90s, and we would catch fish and they'd spit up crawfish, and we'd catch smallmouth and they'd spit up minnows, and they'd spit up shad and shiners. And then all of a sudden, one year we were fishing and the fish started spitting up these fish. Okay, and it, it was before the Department of Natural Resources knew that there were gobies in Lake Erie. And they were these, they were fish that looked like this. When you're from Ohio and you've never seen something like that, you go, oh my God, what is that? And we thought they were little catfish, and then we realized that they weren't, and then we started doing a little investigation, and then the following year we heard there were gobies in Lake Erie. Well, the bass were already eating, okay? Because just like when you plant an exotic species, like a plant of some kind, in an unnatural environment, they took off like that. Okay, so Lake Erie got full of gobies, um, and, and we were fishing a lot of tournaments, and this is several years ago, and the fish were eating gobies, and there were no goby lures on the market. We we're using a technique called drop shotting, which I'm not going to really get into, but we use a pretty small worm on a little hook with a weight below it. It's a real finesse uh, type of presentation, and we were using worms. We were using straight tail plastic worms that were real popular for that technique. And we'd catch these four and five pound smallmouth, and everyone would be spitting off gobies, and I'd be thinking, why are we using a worm when the fish are eating these gobies? So I created the first ever goby drop shot bait, which was the Poor Boys Drop Shot Goby. The following year, when that bait came on the market, like every single major tournament on Lake Erie and Detroit River was won on that route. It won like a half a million dollars in tournament earnings in a matter of five two years. Okay, the fish were really keen on gobies. Since that time, we've, we've used that finesse style application of, of drop shot and fish um, and, and goby baits and the fish eat a lot of gobies. You know, everybody that's ever fished this lake for bass has used a tube and when you bounce a dark colored tube on the bottom, a lot of times the fish think that's a goby. Um, so we're doing a lot of things that mimic gobies, but I wanted to create a bait that was truly a big trophy bait that looked exactly like a goby and that's what we came up with. Okay, and, and a lot of people, this is the first year that this bait has, has been for sale. And I used it um, in an FLW tournament two weeks ago where I, I got a top 10 in the big national tournament here on the Detroit River. Um, and I've caught some huge fish, caught one of the biggest fish, biggest smallmouth I've ever caught on Lake St. Clair on this. Um, but a lot of people have bought it and, and uh, we've had some mixed results. I've got guys in Traverse City that are ordering them every week. And, and people that are fishing here that are killing them on them. And, and guys on Lake Erie that went down to Lake Erie in April, I talked to a guy that was on Erie in April that caught a seven pound, 14 ounce smallmouth on one this April on Lake Erie on a scale weight. Now that's a beast. Um, other people have used it and they can't seem to catch a fish. But the reason that I'm talking about it here and what I want to bring it up again, what, we only have a couple of retailers nationwide, and this is one of them. This is the, the home hub retailer for this lure. But this lure shines on Lake St. Clair in October and November. 
and the reason for and in April and May for smallmouth and walleyes. The reason for it is because that's when all the grass and all the weeds die in our lake. It's not a bait intended to be fished in weedy environments. It catches a lot of weeds. Um, it was made to be fished in the western basin of Lake Erie where there's no weeds. But here, it works awesome in April and May, and then when the grass starts to grow, you start to have mixed results with it. You can still take it out in some of the areas out in the middle of the lake that don't have a lot of weeds and catch fish on it. Guys throw it in some of the areas for large mouth and catch a bunch of fish on it. But if you use it around the channel mouths, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about fall bass, and the areas that you really need to start looking in October and November on our lake are the areas from the North Channel, Grassy Island area. Most everybody fishes here, right? Most everybody that's here fishes the same way. No, I fish up there, North Channel. Okay. Yeah. But I mean this lake, right? So when I'm right. saying all this, everybody's not like, well, dude, we live out in Cass Lake. Oh, no. Really? All right. From the from the Grassy Island North Channel area, all the way to the Canadian border on the South Channel area, within like a half a mile of those channel entrances is dynamite stuff usually in the fall where the major sand flats break off okay from like three four feet and they start to drop whether they're dropping into the channels like on each side of the middle channel whether they're dropping <coughs> off into the lake like the bars and the and the chan and the edges that drop off from like strawberry island and area where the sandy areas drop off into the lake and you go from two or three feet to five or six or eight or ten feet those are fantastic areas for smallmouth in the fall anchor bay gets fantastic usually in the fall from you know and in and anchor bay in the spring is really good usually fairly shallow but in the fall like in the middle of the anchor bay you know out in front of the salt river area kind of in between the salt river and strawberry island and those areas just those big flats um there's a lot of different sandy grass mixes and the fish start to start to get on those and we'll talk about why also, if anybody here fishes around the firecracker or around the entrance to the south channel or the cutoff of the south channel, those areas get fantastic for smallmouth in the fall. Okay, they're, they're, those, those areas I just mentioned are probably the best areas in U.S. waters in October and November to catch smallmouth on the sea. And if you go out then, when most of the grass has died or where you can kind of get in areas where there's not a lot of grass and you use this bait, you'll catch huge fish. If you go to the firecracker area and throw this thing in the fall, you will catch big bass and big walleye. Almost, not every time, but often. <coughs> if, if you're ever interested in, in learning more about it, um, again, it's called the Gobi Replica. The website's gobireplica.com. There's four or five videos on that website. They're all shot either here or on the jury within the last year all of us with legitimate big fish catches on this bait. Five to six pound bass and big walleyes. Okay, so you got it, you gotta try it. Um, again, it's, it's just something that is a real specialized technique and bait for different times of year, uh, but you have a good chance of catching a big string. I, I caught five fish on this bait that weighed almost 28 pounds last spring. Five smallmouth bass on our lake weighed on a scale. So that's a pretty big average. I had like a 612, a 63, a 515, or something on down the line. And a giant fish in five foot of water in the spring. Okay? So it, it can be dynamite, dynamite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. <coughs> yeah, this, this, yeah, and for the walleye too. The walleye start to get in the same areas of the small mountain quite often around those channels in the fall. No, there, there's there's always resident walleye in this lake. And it's funny because, like, I grew up on Lake Erie. And, and when you grow up on Lake Erie and your dad's charter captain, you know, Lake Erie is is literally the walleye in, in the western base of the house oh, on Lake yeah. Erie. It's like a factory. Yeah. When you go down there in the spring to the Port Clinton areas and around the reefs and around Toussaint and Turtle Creek in those areas, they have big industrial dumpsters that they empty every day fish guts from the guys cleaning the fish. Big, I don't know how big a dumpster is from here to the wall. One of those huge dumpsters, they take them out every day at the marinas down there because they clean that many fish in a day. So when you grow up in a place like that, it's that full of walleyes, then you come up here 
and everybody always told me that there's no walleyes here after like July 1st. Yeah. And, and I don't know if the lake is different now than it used to be or what, but we've caught walleyes, smallmouth fishing here this year especially, all year long. We had very good luck this year with the walleyes. Yeah. I was you guys and that was July 1st. But we've seen that the last few years, especially like in October and November, this, they seem to be, I think maybe some of the fish that live in the river maybe come out in the lake a little bit more. You know, the walleyes, I don't really know because I don't do a whole, I mean, I, I fish for them here, we catch them here, but I'm not one of the guys that goes for them every day. But I know that last year when we fished a lot around the channels and the drops around the channels, fishing with that bait to shoot videos, every day we caught two to five walleyes. And they averaged two to four pounds. They were pretty nice fish, like 23, 24 inch fish, big, pretty good fish. So, so that that be, and, and that's the same deal. You cast this thing out. All you do is it, it, it's real heavy. You cast it out. It hits the bottom. You engage your reel and you drag it on the bottom. Okay. And, and I know I'm kind of jumping around, but the whole thing is a goby, a real goby, which our fish eat. And we're even going to talk about gobies the way that perch eat. Okay, because perch eat it too. Gobies don't have swim bladders. Okay, so that means they can't float. If you take a goby and you catch one, like if you're fun fishing at Metro off the thing and you, or somebody catches a goby, and you throw it in the water, you watch it, it doesn't swim to the bottom, it just lays there and it sinks. They don't have a swim bladder. So they spend their whole life laying like that on the bottom. So what we found with this bait, even though it was intended and molded to be a bait you cast out and reel in like a swim bait, we cast it out, let it go to the bottom, and when it gets to the bottom, you just reel up your slack and pull it. And then you reel up your slack and pull it and you just feel it going across the bottom. And then the fish go boom! And about half the time, you'll feel this massive jarring strike and you'll go, and there's no fish there. They come down and for whatever reason, the bass especially, hit them real hard. And then you'll feel them hit them again. And when they hit them, usually the second time, they usually give you slack in your line, which means they suck them up off the bottom and you go down some point. Okay. So they must hit them and kind of kill them. <coughs> But it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's kind of a little niche bait, um, but, but it's, uh, it's really good for big fish. So is that the only color you make them? No, there's a bunch of colors. This, this color is called that one. There is a, is a dark, deep purple. Yeah, that one's popular over right here. This one's called Money Band, and it's, it's like an olive green with bands and stripes. Which is, what we did is we took gobies that we asked that question. Um, we took gobies that we caught on Lake Erie in the Detroit River, uh, on Lake Erie on the Ohio side by Kelly's Island, and some that we caught actually right here at the wall of Beacon's Cove. And we sent them to a guy, we sent pictures to a guy, uh, and we tried to recreate a lot of different colors from different environments. <coughs> you see these banded striped ones on the Detroit River and Lake Erie, and we see these deep purple black ones on Lake Erie. Here, most of them are just sandy colors. So we have a color called Calypso, which is just pure sand color. That works good here. Then we have another one called Purple Descent, which is a pure sandy color with an iridescent purple back. That seems to work everywhere. The guys in Traverse City order that. The guys here order that. The guys in, for some reason, that iridescent purple seems to work everywhere. Then we have one that's like white. And the reason we have a white one is because there's certain places that we fish smallmouth in the spring when you see it. And when you're fishing around spawning bass, and it's important to be able to see your lure. We tried these, and when you cast them out and you pull them by spawning bass, you can't see your lure because they're the same color as the bottom. But that white one, they come down and they hit. So you get the free giveaway go. Sweet. Thank you. See there? All that time, people said, pay attention in class, ask a lot of questions. Why? Well, I just want to It just has one hook in it, though? It's yeah. got one bass. big, meaty hook. How durable are those? The one you get from Bass Pro, they just tear up We've had some that guys have caught 40 fish on, and I still have. The one thing is that every lure is hand painted. That's a real high-end specialized bait. It's not, we realize it's not for everyone. But every one is actually hand painted with an airbrush. So after 25 fish, sometimes they'll lose paint. I tell everybody that asks that question, like, if you have one that gets ripped up from too many fish and you want to send it back, I'll send you another. <laughs> but no one ever does because at that point they're like, well, she's like, like 40 fish. <laughs> the biggest smallmouth of my life. Yeah. But if you want to, that's legit because that way I know you're using it. Because the, the thing with that lure is, and now that it's been on the market a little while, is 
We just need everybody to use it because it's not, it's a big, heavy bait. That bait's $15 is what those cost each. So you can see there, look at how you're making up. <laughs> so we realize you know, not everyone's going to buy a $15 lure. But, you know, it just depends on what you get out of your fishing. This is a $350 fishing rod with a $400 reel. Okay, so I mean, it just depends on, you know, and, and there's different categories. So we don't force it on people. We just know that if you use it and you can get over that, that you'll see that it's worth it. Now, what happened to the poor boys? When the poor boys came out years ago, they were fantastic. In the last five years, forget it. Couldn't tell you. The original poor boys goby is the one that I created. Right. And when it first came out, it was fantastic. Yeah. And like three or four years after it came out in major tournaments, I still carry them in my boat. I very rarely use them. I know guys that do, and they work good. I only carry them because once every two or three years, I'll have an amateur co-angler in my boat who will just be knocking the lights out of the fish, and I can't catch a fish, and I'll ask him what he's using, and he tells me he's using a bait that I created 15 years ago, and it about kills me. I had a guy actually use one. They had one called Baylog's Choice was the color. And he caught a huge stringer in an Everstart years ago. And he goes, I'm using this Kobe thing. It's called Baylog's Choice. I got a bunch of them. You want one? And I thought, dude, <laughs> this is something. I'm good. I'm good. So I carry some. And they still do work. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's a lot of the, – I'm not going to get way into the bass stuff because we really want to get on that perch and that pampish stuff. Yes. But the – but the bass drop shotting plastics, it's so strange now, and I think it's just because of fishing pressure. One day you catch them on a little worm that's like this, the next day you catch them on a big darter, the next day you catch them on a cross touch jab, the next day you catch them on a trigger X minnow. They're, I carry like 25 different things, and they seem to change. So you just get a bunch of them, keep trying. Some days they're on that road. I use a lot of trigger X baits. Those are really good at times. For this? For this big guy, this is 15 pound line, Florida, and I tie a polymer on. You need fairly heavy line with this. This is a one ounce bait, and when you have a big, two things with, well, three things. Yes. This bait, when it falls, it spirals, okay? And at first, we didn't want that, but for some reason, it seems to actually, the fish seem to get on it better because of that. We've had some that fall straight down and the ones that spiral for some reason, just like a tube jig. There's something about a spiral and fall. So it, it could, after a lot of casts, it could twist your line. So you don't want to use real light line because you don't want to potentially lose this expensive loop. Secondly, um, you have to use a big heavy rod to hook the fish. And, and also, whenever, one thing that people don't understand, whether you're throwing a one ounce swim bait like this crankbait, this is a DT10 crankbait. It's a sizable crankbait, it's not as big as some, but some of the 20 foot diving big giant crankbaits, they may weigh almost an ounce, three quarters of an ounce to an ounce, okay? Uh, a big, big spinner bait, something like that that weighs three quarters of an ounce to an ounce. When you cast those baits all day and they're an ounce, it is a tremendous stress on your line. So you want fairly heavy line because what will happen is just casting it expands your line because it's so heavy. So this, I always tell everybody, don't use less than 15. I got a buddy that uses it all the time on 12, but if he loses one, he gets another. He doesn't care. I tell him, tell everybody, 15 pound test. Floral card. Okay? So that's a little bit about the Gobi Rep. Uh, purple the best color. <laughs> if I only fished here, I'd have purple ir iridescent purple, purple descent, and calypso. That sandy calypso one, I like that one quite a bit too. Um, a little, a bit of other stuff about you know fishing in the fall. Um, if you're gonna bass fish, besides something like that, everybody knows, um, you know, tubes are fantastic on our lake. And just coming from a guy that fishes all the time on this lake, I don't use a tube a whole heck of a lot. I mean, I do, but. But I'm not, you know, one of the guys that uses 100% of the time. There's a bunch of baits that catch fish out here. But in the fall, it is fantastic. You know, that's one thing you have to have tied on in the fall. Something, you know, bait fish colored, goby colored, whatever, quarter ounce head, something like that. I'm going to talk one thing about it, too. Uh, and, and crank baits. Okay, and I'm going to give you a couple little quick tips about this stuff. This is a DT-10. This is a 
this is an old reliable raffle of crankbait, okay? And um, DT10s are really good baits, DT14s, depending on the depth you're, you're fishing, they, they run to the depth they're advertised to run. They cast really good, they have a good wobble to them. Um, so I pretty much stick with those raffle of baits. With tubes, one thing that I've done the last couple years, and it doesn't matter who you are, your skill level, this will help you guys someday. Um, I started using braided line, okay, and this, this braided line here is, is old, and that's why it's the color. This is called Suffix 832. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of braided line out there. This is the best one, in my opinion. It's, it's more oval shaped. It sinks, unlike a lot of braided line, which floats. Um, but you can get a lot of different braided line. This line is four pound test diameter, and it's 10 pound test strength. Okay, that means it's as small as four, but as strong as 10. And believe me, this is way stronger than 10. You could not break this line with your hands, no matter how hard you pull. You can use braided line and tie a number of different knots. I tie a knot called a uni uni to fluorocarbon line. That's my knot right there, that little frayed up thing. You see, the reason it looks like that is because it went through my guides 10,000 times and it just got poofed out on the edge. And you put like a five foot liter of fluorocarbon line, I use suffix fluorocarbon eight pound line, and this never twists, and even if it does, it never flies off your spool. This spool of line has been on my reel all year, and I fish at least four times a week. Okay, I fish a lot. You never have to change it. Guys will actually take their braided line like this, they'll pull it all off, take the opposite end, tie it back to their spool and wind it all on so it's going, what's on top is now on bottom and what was on bottom is now, and, and it's like getting all new line again. It like never wears out. So if you tube fish a lot on this lake, I want you guys to try it. Get braided line. You can use a lighter rod because braided line has no stretch. This is a fairly, you know, this is like a medium action rod. It's good for, you know, hooking fish and fighting fish that jump a lot. You don't lose any fish. And that stuff is so easy to use. I test for you. Uh, this is eight. This is eight pound test. You could use ten. You could use twelve. You could use six. I use six drop shot. But but uh, eight all around on this lake. And and I frequently take people fishing, whether they're outdoor riders um, or guide trip clients, or like outdoor riders. Everybody thinks that outdoor riders would be good fishermen. Outdoor riders are usually terrible fishermen. They're good writers about fishing. <laughs> okay, but most of them can't fish hardly at all. I think I've fished with one outdoor writer that I would consider a good fisherman ever in my life. And you know they're they're terrible on your equipment, right. but when you use pure fluorocarbon with a tube, it'll twist it a lot. You'll get where the line jumps off your reel all the time, and it's a constant headache. You just pull that off, and it's like guaranteed. Okay. But, but tube fishing too, make sure guys that you have a pretty good rod, you know, lengthwise and, and you know, keep something fairly limber um, and, and it's, it's a good deal. Now, another little quick tip, this is, this is your, your average everyday DT crankbait. What, what was the name of your braid line? Uh, the stuff I use is called Suffix 832. Do have it here? I don't know. Yeah, yes, yeah. they do. It's expensive, right. but it, it will last if you're a recreational fisherman i'm telling you it'll last you two years easy you'll only buy one spool of it you'll get three refills out of one spool and it'll last you two years i mean it never it never goes bad it's it's awesome um your average everyday crankbait that's going to go out and do a lot of work in those areas i was telling you that six to ten foot depth range this being a, a dt10 couple things um, one thing you'll see from, from people that are bass fishing a lot, you'll read about the pro tournaments and things, fluorocarbon line is like the way to go. Okay, and, and for cranking, any kind of crankbait, it gives you a way better feel. You feel your bait better, it gets your bait deeper, it has no stretch, it hooks the fish better, fluorocarbon line. So I'm using like 10 or 12 pound straight fluorocarbon rod line when I'm fishing a crankbait. But a couple things, and, and the reason I'm kind of giving you these tips is because it doesn't matter your skill level, a couple things. One thing is, if you crankbait fish for smallmouth versus largemouth, if you pick up your, your bass fishing magazine illustrated tomorrow, and it talks about crankbait fishing, they're going to tell you you use a big, whippy fiberglass rod because the fish grab the crankbait, 
and it gives to the fish and they don't throw the hook and all that. That's great if you're fishing in Tennessee for large bass. If you're fishing for small mouse, in my opinion, you need a little bit more rod with a little bit more guts to it. You still want a little bit, you know, of a tip and you want something fairly limber, but I use a graphite rod. Okay, I have found after thousands and thousands of fish, smallmouth fishing, that smallmouth usually hit a crankbait, and very rarely do they hit it where it comes in where it's hooked all the way down their mouth because they come up and inhale it like a large one. They hit real aggressively, they run into baits, they slash at stuff, they school up and fight over lures, and if you use something that's got a little bit more backbone and is a graphite rod, you'll actually catch more fish cranking with smallmouth. The other thing is, this, this reel, you're going to see a lot more technology like this. This is something really cool. This reel, you see, you see my reel, watch right here. See when I push the button? You see that channel, how it's a big wide channel? Mm -hmm. It's amazing nobody figured this out. If you crankbait fish a lot, chances are you probably use a bait caster. And if you use a bait caster, the line all goes through that one little hole. Mm -hmm. And it goes back and forth on your spool. But that hole stays in one spot when you free spool the caster. So as your line goes through that hole, it's traveling back and forth on your spool, and it's got friction hitting that, what would they call a worm gear, or got, you know, your reel guide, as the line travels through. Now this reel, when you push the button, the line all goes out to a big, long port. So it just flies off the reel like a spinning reel. When you cast this, you can cast almost all the line off your reel. This is a Daiwa reel. It's called the T3. I don't know if they've patented that technology, but they have and every reel have it. So be on the lookout for that. If you're in the market for a bait caster, you can really cast it further because of that. But get something, get a lure you can cast a long way, cover a lot of ground, cranking for small mouths, get a fairly sizable rod. Um, and, and this time of year, guys, what I want you to, if nothing else from the little small mouth section here, what I want you to take away is you're looking for a spot where you're going to catch them every cast. They school, they get aggressive in the fall, you're on an awesome, awesome lake. I'm not even going to tell you what color crankbait that is because it doesn't matter. What you're looking for is a place where they hit all colors of crankbaits. Okay, so go out in those areas, spend a lot of time fishing pretty quick, look for big concentrations of fish and you'll catch them. Any last minute fast questions?